There are people in the body of Christ who are like really involved with politics, and there's people involved in the body of Christ who are not involved in politics. And sometimes people that are not involved in politics will come against people that are. But I think the body of Christ needs to, to you know, come together as a remnant and realize that some people's calling is to get involved in the political scene. Listen, if, if you want to stop um, the satanic agenda of people killing God's heritage, the children, you kind of get involved in politics. If you want to stop the satanic uh, stuff that's going on in the schools and the school board and all the lies, how they're trying to rewrite history, and they're trying to tear down statues and get rid of history and make things up out of thin air for their agenda, you got to get involved. So I'd ask as a church that people don't come down on people that are getting involved in politics or, or, or have that calling. And then, and then the people that do get involved in politics shouldn't come against the body of believers or the, the Christians that don't want to get involved with it because they can pray and do other things. The point of it is, is we're a body of Christ. And we have people that do different um, operations. And just because somebody doesn't do it like you doesn't mean that they're not of God or that we shouldn't join with them and be you know, unified with them. Uh, there was a scene in The Gladiator where they released the chariots on these little people, like a remnant of them. There was only a few of them. And they released these chariots on them. And they thought that the crowd was rooting for the chariots. They were just like, hey, these are a band of barbarian rebels, you know, against, you know, our armies kind of thing. And so at the end, there's only a few of them. And Maximus is like, you know, hold, hold the line, hold the line. And they're, they're putting their shields together. They come in real tight. And these chariots were coming up uh, for them. And they were able to, uh, you know, basically create a ramp to where the chariot flipped. And then they got those horses and they cut the heads off of the other people. But the point of that is, is that we are a church and we need to unify um, God will bring people uh, into anointed positions to do certain works that you may or may not agree with. King David was a mighty man of God. He wrote psalms and did great, great things, but yet, you know, he made some mistakes too. You know, he, he fell in love with Bathsheba when he saw her naked on the rooftop and then ended up killing her husband to cover it up. But then he wasn't sorry he got caught. He was sorry he actually did it. He says, God created me a clean heart. Restore a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Sometimes we do these altar calls at prison, and you can tell the guys are coming up just because they want to look good or get extra, you know, the parole board to look good on them or whatever. There's, a, there's an actual repentance where you're actually broken, that you've done something. And then there's a fake repentance where, hey, I'm sorry I got caught type of thing. But, you know, God will bring out people like Donald Trump. You know, I don't like everything Donald Trump did, but I can tell that he was anointed by God. I could tell that. And Donald Trump's not going to unite the Christians. That's not his job. If God brings him on the scene, he would have brought him in like a David to kill Goliath and to bring down Goliath. And the thing is, is God did it under all of our noses to where we as believers, you know, many people in the church didn't, didn't understand what God was doing with Trump. I didn't. I was like, at first I was like, ah, I think Carson would be a good, a good candidate, you know, Ben Carson. Ben Carson is a phenomenal Christian, but that's not the guy that God had chosen to bring down some of those uh, real sadistic psychopaths in the uh, in the government that were entrenched, you know, and all the stuff that was going on. And remember, the Bible says, "Don't touch God's anointed; do His prophets no, no harm." Look at what happened to the the actual CEO of CNN when uh, they didn't talk about this. I'm just I'm just free flowing right now. But remember, CNN. Uh, you know, president, he was trying to nail Trump on the uh, affair, then he gets nailed on the affair. The Como brothers, they try to nail Trump. They're trashed. You got the creepy porn lawyer, lawyer Ab Abinadi. He's now doing time. You know, all these people that were coming against Trump are now just getting wasted. Nancy Pelosi's next. Yeah, yeah. Because you got people like Dutch Sheets, you got people confessing for exposure and for, you know, righteousness and truth and justice to come. It's, it's the hammers being dropped on the devil and his workers, yeah. so he cannot stop it. Now, you know, I read the book, and some of us, some of us get our heads cut off, but we win. Some of us, you know, he who endures to the end shall be saved. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, the thing is, is the Apostle Paul, in his word, he talks about being shipwrecked. He talks about, 
going through a night, night and day. He, he talks about all the stuff the Apostle Paul went through for the gospel. And he says, he says these words. <laughs> but, but this is a light affliction. I'm like, sorry, Apostle Paul, let me ask you something. Three days in the ocean, not, you know, with the sharks. Maybe you knew you were going to live because you had prophetic understanding that you had to fulfill what God had called you to do, even if you died and somebody raised you from the dead. But at night and a day in the deep, imprisonments, being stoned, he called that light affliction. And I'm thinking to myself, man, when I do counseling as a pastor, I got people that are so focused on themselves many times. And they trip out. They don't even know if they want to continue to serve the Lord because of some trial they went through. And he's calling them. One of those things, I don't think any of the people that I've talked to, it's just one of them. And he had a whole list. For much lighter issues, people were wanting to give up. And I thought, well, that's really hokey faith. They don't really know God. Amen. They don't have a, cement, a cementing saying, live or die, I'm serving God, and I'm going to uh, profess the Lord Jesus, and I'm going to walk this thing out. Now I've had people tell me, I would die for Christ. And I tell them, no, you wouldn't. Why do you say that? I said, because if you're not faithful in the little things, you're not faithful in the big things. If you won't sit there and, and uh, you know, uh, have a prayer life or have a life of evangelizing, how are you going to die for Christ? You die when you walk up to somebody and they make fun of you and you don't look very cool and you say some words to them. Tell them, Jesus said, even if they don't believe you. Tell them. Even if they don't receive you, that I love them. Tell them. And yet, some of you guys, you say that you would die for Christ, but you won't even put your pride down under the basket and go and, and, and be laughed at to tell somebody words of the Lord that they might laugh at you then, but later at night, those words are pounding them until they get saved because they didn't come from you. They came from the Lord. They're words of life. Anyways, um, praise the Lord. So let's go, um, to the, this morning I'm going to talk about the soul. I want to talk about the soul. Now, the Bible talks about the heart, the soul, the spirit. And, um, you know, uh, your soul realm is an interesting, it's an interesting place in the sense of understanding it. Sometimes you'll see in the Bible, heart and soul kind of interchanged. You really have to look up in the word in the uh, the Greek and the Hebrew to see what, what, what word they're, they're talking about. But in the Hebrew, the soul is uh, N-E-P-H-E-S-H. -E it's, it's nephesh. And in the Greek, it's, it's P-S-Y-K-H-E. It's like psyche. Or, or P-S-Y-K-H-E in the Greek. I don't know how to, to pronounce that. It's, it could be a P. Psyche. Psyche. So no, I don't know if that is, I think it's pronounced P-S-Y-K-H-E is the Greek word. But we can't take the English translation of that and think that it's, you know, sounded out the same way. Yeah. I'd have to go look at it, the way it's pronounced, actually. Yeah. But it could be where you get psyche from, I don't yeah. know. That's, that's an interesting thought. Turn to Genesis um, 9-5. On Friday... I just got word that a good friend of mine had been uh, diagnosed with stage four cancer. He went in for a hernia checkup, and his 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 uh, he's an old Marine, Vietnam vet. I used to go hunting with him, and we would talk about the, the, the doctrine because he was a Lutheran boy, and he was a you know he was a Vietnam vet, like I said. He was a, a just a great guy. He had this uh, canvas tent with this wood stove, and so we'd go out, and there was snow. It'd be snowing outside. We'd get a campsite, and we would go ahead and be like, uh, you know, 70 degrees inside the tent. I mean, we'd have steak dinners with vegetables and uh, salad and everything else. Everyone else would be eating, like, canned food in the rest of the campsite or where, where we'd hunt. But he liked things nice. I guess being a Marine out there in Vietnam, you kind of at some point go, you know, if I'm going to hunt stuff, I want to enjoy it, you know. Yeah. But he was uh, a logger and a... He was a, a farmer and construction, and he always said, now, life's too short for cheap cigars and cheap whiskey. He said he'd always have really nice cigars, and I'm not a whiskey drinker, but I can tell what he was buying was expensive. 
Now we would talk, and I never really got a chance to get him over to uh, salvation. I'd say, man, Mike, it's in Jesus. You got a relationship with Jesus. So we would talk. We would talk. He was a very smart guy, college graduate, you know. And so he would have these deep thoughts. But now they're on his deathbed. I said, are you ready to go see the Lord Friday? The Lord prompted me. He said, go down there now. Don't wait. So I went. And when I went in there, they said, well, sir, you, you cannot come in because of COVID restrictions and stuff. And so I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm a chaplain, and um, I've been requested to come. Not by him, by somebody else that knew him. said, hey, go see, you know, go see Mike. But the Lord told me to go now. I was busy, but God said, go now. And I, and I felt that because I felt like he wasn't going to have his coherence. Coherence. Oh, wow. And so I went there, and sure enough, he went in the day before. He had said to me, I've been in here for a month. He'd only been in there a night, one night. Mm -hmm. Stage four cancer racked his body, one lung gone, barely breathing in one lung. And uh, Ryan Enos and I drove down there, and, and uh, I, was, I was talking to him. I said, are you ready to go see the Lord? He goes, yeah, I was baptized Lutheran. I was like, no, that's a wrong answer. The Lutheran church never spilled its blood for anybody. As great as God used Martin Luther to reveal more truth, to the Catholic Church of its 88 points of grace and all that, which were powerful. The Catholic Church had a foundation of the crucifixion. But Martin Luther came, and he, but see now, you can't put your confidence in a church or a man. It's got to be in Jesus. Amen. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. I said, Mike, would you pray for me? Would you just pray with me? He goes, yeah, I didn't even have time to really talk to him theologically to tell him why, you know, that's not a good answer or whatever. He goes, yeah, I will, you know. And um, we talked, you know, a little bit, shared some laughs about some stuff that we'd done. And, uh, I prayed with him, and he uh, asked the Lord to come in his heart, wash him with his blood, and prayed that. But I felt the peace in the room Amen. when we did that. And, uh, you know, I, I left, and um, I tried to get into another room because there was another guy there who hooked up the tubes. And I said to, to, to one of the nurses, I said, hey, can I go in and talk, you know, uh, can I talk, and, and come, you know, to, 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 uh, to my, and he was thinking I was talking about Mike, but I was like, I want to talk to these other people. He's like, yeah, as long as he doesn't cuss you out. This guy with tubes on, he's like, no, you can't go in there. I'm like, well, as long as he doesn't, no, you can't go in another patient's room, so. I really felt the Lord wanted me to do more ministry up there with these other people. Some of those people were dying, hooked up to tubes, and they don't have any uh, friends or people visiting them. You know, they're, they're just going. You know, before death, you're all, uh, you know, like laid back, you know. And uh, I don't know what I was saying in all that. It's just that um, we have to tell people while they're alive, yeah. not when they're hooked up to tubes. Yeah, right. You might not get a chance because they're not letting people into the hospitals, mm -hmm. okay? And I had to fight just to get in there to see my friend. Well, ultimately, our goal is not to pray with somebody at their deathbed for salvation. Our goal is that somebody would live in Christ here. And they, they wouldn't think that, you know, you know, if you like good food or good cigars or good whiskey, good whiskey and good cigars don't really go with the, the Christian life. But, you know, that's fine. You like good food. But the thing is, is that when somebody comes to the Lord, they realize that their soul gets satisfied with His presence and who He is. And there's different things that they would say, hey, life's too short not to know God or walk with God. Amen. You know, that's, that's what I would say. Um, so this soul here, let's go to Genesis uh, 9. No, let's just, let's back up a little further even to this. Let's go to Genesis 2-7. Let's look at some things here. Just, let's talk this morning. 2-7 uh, says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and, and the man became a living being. Or it says, man, some translation talk about man uh, came alive, or, or, or had a soul. Here it, it says that the Lord God formed man in the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils, and the breath of life, and the breath of, of life. So it says it's formed in the dust of the ground, and breathed into the, his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living soul. Huh. He became that after he did. But that breath of life was God as spirit. He breathed himself into a spirit. 
He didn't do that to, to the animals. What separates you from the animal kingdom is your, your human spirit. When you get born again, you're, you're spiritually dead. You go to spiritual life. Okay? See, people are in hell are alive. People that walk with the devil are alive, but they don't have the Zoe God kind of life. They're missing out on the prophetic force of knowing, of knowing the future. And so here, here uh, the devil can parrot and repeat, but he cannot operate in the gifts of the Spirit, the love of God. The devil is um, a scam, a sham, a liar, and he can only mimic. And uh, he, he'd been kicked out and, and put under feet and destroyed. Now, Genesis 2.9, it says a man became a soul. Now let's look at Genesis 9.5. Let's look at some stuff here. I'm looking into this myself. There's things that I know about this, and there's things, still questions that, that I have. Uh, surely for your life, your life blood, I will uh, demand a rebuke. From the hand of every beast, I will require it. And from the hand of every man, from the hand of every man's brother, I will require uh, the life of, uh, life of a man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God, he made man. And as for you, be fruitful, multiply, bring forth an abundancy on the earth, and multiply in it. Then, uh, now, now look at this. Uh, so the blood, the blood of, of the, uh, the person is, is talked about there. If you go to, let's go to, to um, Genesis 1.20. I want to show you something here about animals. It says, Then God said, Let their waters abound with abundance of living creatures, and let the birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heaven. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abound according to their kind. And every winged bird, according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. So in the evening and the morning, on the fifth day. Okay, so uh, this translation doesn't really, you know, uh, bring it out. But in some, some translation, okay, now look, look, look at verse 25. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and every... Everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. Uh, it was there was something in here I wanted to bring out, uh, showing that there was a living soul in the uh, animal. As far as I can tell, biblically, an animal doesn't have a spirit, but they do. They can have a soul within them. Um, and if you look at Joshua 11.11, 11, he talks about, because sometimes, you know, people say, you know that scripture that says, fear him who cannot kill uh, the soul, but can kill the body? Um, or fear God who, or fear the one, because man can only kill your body, but they can't, uh, you know, kill your soul. What would a man gain if he gained the whole world and lost his soul, profits and nothing? Um, he's talk, we're talking about the soul versus the spirit on that. And essentially, uh, with the soul realm, a lot of times uh, people think, well, the soul is not part of the physical person. But then look at this scripture in Joshua, which is kind of interesting. It's Joshua 11.11. 11. If I can find it here. I think uh, Joshua's right before Judges. 11.11. 11. He says, and they struck all the people who were, were in it with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying them. There was none left breathing. Then they burned Hazar with fire. And, uh, and in that scripture, uh, it kind of looks a little different. If you look at the original text and then, then like how it translates out. But it, it was like um, there was a correlation between the blood and the soul. That was what I was getting at. Yeah, that was King James. What's that? Oh, never mind. Um, yeah, this is the King James. So all the cities of those kings and their kings and Joshua took and struck with the edge of the sword. He utterly destroyed them as Moses the servant of the Lord had commanded. 
But as far, but as for the cities that stood on, on their mounds, Israel burned none of them. But anyways, it was it was different, a little bit different translation than what the, my Bible is talking, or my translation is talking about. It, it appeared to be a link between the blood and the soul, which is it was interesting. Well, the Bible says the life is in the blood. But look at look at um, when I'm talking about soul here. Many times I was looking at soul as the mind, the will, the intellect, the emotions. And you look at Jacob, and he said, "Hey, give me, give me some food." Okay, to um, he was talking about Jacob um, when you know when you you know Jacob and Esau when you're talking about blessing him. He's like, like, give me some food, and uh, I think Isaac, you know. Um, and, and he said, then my soul will bless you. When he was wanting a blessing. But food makes the soul happy. There's sometimes we'll fast, you know, we'll, we'll, go, we'll go without food. And we'll fast and we'll do warfare. But the soul realm of a person, and, and like um, King David asks this question. He says, he says, why are you downcast? How come you're downcast? Now people in this day and age would look at somebody like they needed to go see a therapist if they were talking to themselves. But you gotta realize you got different parts of your body. You got, you got your body, your physical person. If you're in pain, that can affect you know, your soul. That can affect your soul. But, but you know, King David was asking the question, how come you're downcast in my soul? He's talking to his soul. He's asking his soul a question. And it talks about in, um, in Psalms 15, talks about who speaks the truth in his soul. This, this is a person who will see God. Um, sometimes people will deceive you. They'll, they'll tell, tell you, hey, I'm feeling this way. They're really not feeling that way. You know, there's a lot of people that are deceptive with their soul. The heart and the soul, sometimes in the Bible, I'm noticing, are somewhat interchangeable. But you've got to see that different than your spirit. You have a spirit. You are a spirit. You have a soul. And you live in a body. The part of you that is least real is what you see and touch. This physical being with cells that experiences pain and all that. This is the least real part of you. The most real part of you is unseen and eternal. There was a guy named Ronald Coyne who, T. L. I believe it was T.L. Osborne's sister, prayed for Ronald Coyne in the tent revival. I think it was T.L. Osborne's sister. It's either T.L. Osborne's sister or one of T.L. Osborne's relatives. They had a tent revival. And Ronald Coyne didn't have any eye. All he had was a fleshly mound of, of just, of just um, a tissue. Because his eye had been cut out or whatever, or he didn't have an eye. And so anyways, it ends up where all of a sudden he can see, but he never got a creative miracle of an eye. It was just a fleshly mound of flesh there. No eye came. And so Teddy, my friend, had taped off this eye real good to where he couldn't see out of it. And he could read your license and everything else. Well, God gave him vision. I was asking the Lord about that, and the Lord was saying, I used his spiritual eye to see into the natural. Just like sometimes you'll see demons with your natural eye. You know, I'm using your natural eye to see a demonic spirit. Well, it's just the spiritual body. Because you spirit, you got a spiritual mind. You have spiritual eyes, a nose, a tongue. Remember the rich man in Lazarus? He was in hell. And Lazarus was in um, heaven, and the rich man yelled out, Can you dip your finger in water, whatever, and put it on my tongue? Well, he's a spiritual being, no longer in a physical presence, but he's got a tongue. He can see, he's got eyes, he's got, you know. So you're a spiritual man. So in Romans 8, when he's talking about spirit so much, and a lot of times, you know, we will dismiss the soul, but you have a soul. Your soul can get wounded. Your soul, God gives you ways to protect your soul from getting all rotten and destroyed. He says if you ever are um, in a situation where somebody does you wrong, forgive them. It doesn't matter what they did. You, get, you must forgive. You must walk in this forgiveness. That is ministry to your soul. Your soul gets life by forgiveness. It's healing to your soul. It doesn't mean that you excuse what somebody did. It doesn't mean that you let people continue to walk on you. It doesn't mean that you don't hold somebody accountable. Listen to me. I've gotten shots taken at me for standing up against people who did dirt. 
and going to the cops with it because I knew they would do it again and again and again. I had a guy pull a knife on me one time because I went to his parole officer about something and I said, I'll do it again. I am, don't, don't pull this stuff with me, stitches get stitches. You come out with me with a knife and I'll kill you, I'll cut your throat out, you understand me? I said, first of all, I don't go by demonic organization of the prison. If you're doing dirt, I'm gonna call you out and confront you, period. Hopefully to restore you and get you right. But if you think I'm one of these convicts that you're on the yard with and we're just gonna keep it quiet, I'm not, because you haven't changed. And I wanna see you do the maximum amount of time until you come to the end of yourself and you actually wanna quit this business. Pull a knife on me, I've called people out. And I had a guy named Dave, he killed five people in OSP. He went to OSP for killing five people. Big old guy, probably 350 pounds. <clears throat> And one day the Holy Ghost speaks up inside me and says, the reason you are the way you are is you always blame other people and you never take responsibility yourself. It wasn't your ex-wife. It wasn't this or that. It's you. You're wrong. You need to repent. And he got so mad at me, he charged me, and he started choking me. And I was going to break his choking, but then I looked at his eyes and I saw a demon. So I was like, come out of him in Jesus' name. I can rebuke him. I could hardly say it, but I was rebuking this devil. All of a sudden, he you know, flung on the ground and was crying. I looked over and there was this 100 pound uh, convict that just got out and he was scared today. And I was like, now listen man, if I was in your shoes, I'd have taken that metal pipe there and cracked him on the head. You need to support your local pastor. You're a wuss. You're not gonna <laughs> fight somebody, you know what I mean? Like, like you're gonna let me get choked out like that? That's stupid. Yeah. Now, it was a devil, you know what I mean? And so when I was gonna go at it physically, and Dave was a huge man, I don't know how I'd done, I know I'd put a hurting on him, I know that. I don't know if I won or lost. I don't know. But when I seen it was a spirit, I didn't go that way. I went the way of rebuking that spirit. Amen. Well, he wasn't wanting to be called out. Everybody just placated him because he was a big, intimidating guy. Not the Holy Ghost. He's not intimidated by somebody's size or anything else like that. He wants people's hearts to be right and in the right place. Now, um, when we're looking at the soul of a man or woman, we're looking at, at, at a realm here that doesn't get much attention. Your soul will conform itself to whatever you surrender itself to. In other words, if you listen to nothing but satanic music, you're gonna be a messed up individual because you're gonna be thinking about satanic stuff. If you watch nothing but um, you know uh, filthy stuff, you're gonna be messed up. King David said, I don't put anything wicked before my eyes. I don't put anything, um, what does he say? It's, no, he doesn't say wicked. He says, I don't put anything, uh, I think, unclean. Or is, uh, what scripture is that? He says, I don't put anything. Um, and maybe that's after he went through the situation with Bathsheba. Where you say that uh, and, um, unclean. Um, he, and maybe that's after he went through the situation with Bathsheba to where he paid such a heavy price after that sin. God said the sword's never going to leave your house. Some of his kids were killed. Some of his, his kids were fighting. His own uh, son that he had with Bathsheba died because of his sin. And so maybe then he figured, well, I better not look out my window at night and, you know, see these ladies bathing on top of a, a house. Or maybe he was talking about other stuff, too. It's not just one dimensional. It's just not one thing. But, um, you know, it's interesting. Um, he, had, he, had, he had asked about his son, his son Absalom when his, Absalom was caught in a tree in his hair. And he was hanging there with his hair. And he says, please do not touch my son Absalom, even though Absalom was trying to kill him and take over. He said the sword would not, um, you know, God said the sword would not depart from your house. What's that? You're right. It's uh, Psalm 101, verse 3. I will not, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. Yeah, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. But you and I set wicked things before our eyes many times on listening to music that is not glorifying to God. I don't care about the genre. Some demonic religious spirits say, well, you can't listen to rap, or you can't listen to this. That's just foolishness. The Bible says the children of darkness are wiser in their generation than children of light. You can listen to rap all you want. Just make sure that that rap is speaking the word of God and truth and encouraging you. You can listen to classical music. You can listen to country western. You can listen to whatever. Gospel music is not a genre. Gospel music is music that tells the truth of God's word and lifts a person up. But if you sit there and you listen and you minister to your soul darkness, your soul's going to be dark. If you lie to your soul, your soul's going to be dark. If you listen to demons that tell you, oh, you don't deserve to be treated that way. They shouldn't have done this to you. To try to get you into unforgiveness. Or those demons that will bring back and replay the, the, the dirty things people did to try to get you mad. 
You need to shut that off. There could be people gloating they took advantage of you. Pray for them. Get into the heavenly operation of forgiveness and just rip Satan's throat out. What's his throat? His voice. Rip his throat out. How do you do that? Walk in love, walk in forgiveness. You forgive them and say, you know what? Sometimes, too, people that do you wrong, they don't even know that they're doing it. They're so demonized. Hurting people hurt people. And they're, they're just a truck of the devil. The devil's driving them. You're mad at them, but it's really the driver that you should be mad at. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. The devil gets people down here fighting and, and gouging each other's eyes out, and he gets away scot-free. You know, my daughter the other day had seen a, a person that was caught up in lesbianism so hard, yet set free and delivered of years of anxiety and pain and not knowing who she was, identity corruption, you know, set free, baptized, saved, healed, delivered. And she heard this thing about Disney. She was, that's so messed up. If people seen demons come out of people, it's, if people saw people in the gay le lifestyle that were suicidal and miserable and depressed get set free, and then they see that Disney's trying to glorify this, that's so messed up. I'm like, now you're thinking in the right manner. That's the truth. Okay, but, but people many times don't see that because they're so deceived. Nobody from the gay community is talking about the corruption on TV and the pain of it. They're only saying, don't step on the toes. We all can be that way. Bullcrap. That's a perversion. It's not the norm. You're talking about 3% of the people. Hollywood and these satanic agendas are trying to take obscure minority things and act like it is a mainstream deal or it is the masses. It's not. You're talking about 3%. On the, on the sex change stuff, you're talking about less than 1%. You're talking about real minute. Now, they would like to get into a more mainstream attitude and convince and, and, and dope people over. But those spirits behind all that were doing all that kind of stuff with uh, Noah before. Not with Noah, but with the people of Noah's time. All the sexual morality and all that. That was all going on. And then God bring the flood and wiped all those people out as an act of mercy so kids wouldn't get raped for the next 2,000 years. You just killed everybody that was doing this corruption. Now those same spirits that were working in Noah's day are now trying to come back in our day. So it shall be in the end time. We're going to see a lot brighter works of God and mighty men of God and mighty women of God rising up. And we're going to see Satan getting very uh, boisterous because his time has come to, to a time. Remember when those demons cried out and said, Jesus, um, how, how can you come before our time? There's a time, and they know they're going to be judged, and they know they're going to be thrown in the lake of fire, and so will Satan. But he's trying to get the humans, as many humans as he can. Well, talking about the soul, I'm going to read a couple of scriptures, and then cut you guys loose. Um, in Psalms 139, um, it's, uh, well, let's just go to Psalms here. Um, let's go, go to Psalms. Um, I'm trying to start at the lower end of Psalms. Psalms 42. Verse 11, does someone want to read that? Actually, someone go to Psalms 19.7. That's even back a little bit further. Actually, what? 7. 7. 7. 7. 7. 7. 7. <clears throat> the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. All right, your soul needs to be converted. It needs to be transformed. Do you realize this? And I was, I was kind of joking about this, but I'm telling you the truth. If you take somebody, let's say you take a guy from Central Oregon that grew up on a ranch, and, you know, he's all he knows is farming, and he comes in here, he's got his wranglers and his big belt buckle, all this business, and all of a sudden we put him over and we take him to England, and all of a sudden we live in there for two years, and we come over there and, He's drinking tea with his pinky out and says, you know, <laughs> well, hello, good chap. <laughs> Let's have a spot of tea, you know. And before he was, you know, a skull, tobacco chewing, cow crap on his boots, man, you know, your soul conforms itself to whatever you put itself around. The Bible says, renew your mind that you may prove what is good, acceptable, perfect will of God. If your soul is being fed a bunch of lies of the devil about unforgiveness, and it's all about you and selfishness, and you go through some trials, 
I'm giving up. Blah, 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 blah. Ah, shut up, you little flesh creature. I'm going to whip the tar out of you. You understand me? No. Well, Paul goes through all this stuff. One of those items was very big, a whole list, and he says it's a light affliction. I'm thinking to myself, man, Paul, you're really raising the bar here. Bro. <laughs> so here he's talking about it convert, converting your soul. Your soul needs to be converted, your mind, your will, your intellect, your emotions. We reason with ourselves to convince ourselves what we're doing is right and it's bull crap. It's all wrong. God doesn't grade on a curve. His word is true, and every man's a liar. The devil's a liar. So the Bible says to renew your mind in Romans 12 that you may prove what is good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Convert your soul. He says here your soul can be converted. And he's not talking about salvation. Salvation is where you receive Jesus in, and you go from a spiritually dead man to a spiritually alive man. There's people that accepted Christ in their heart and believed on Christ and become a spiritually alive but they've left their soul in trash. I got a friend of mine, I'm not going to say his name on camera because he might be watching today, but I said, you know what, you're the laziest Christian I've ever met. I'm like, seriously, six years after you're born again, you're still smoking Marlboros? You couldn't do damage on your soul to renew your mind? Do you, you pray in tongues? Do you read the Word of God? Do you fast? Do you do any of this stuff to pound on your soul and bring it into subjection? Yeah. Well, one time I had him fasting with me a couple of days, and all he could say was, can we quit? Can we quit? Are we done? This is too bad. I'm like, you haven't even got past the hunger pains. I mean, you get to a place where you're not hungry anymore. He never reached that zone. You know, he was wanting to crack it on. And then he ate like three packs of breath mints because he was fasting. He's in the men's restroom at the church, ripping one. And all, all he could say was, now listen, it smells so many fresh in He says, I'm so good, my crap smells good. He's you know? <laughs> <laughs> been for several days, been eating breath mints. Anyway, I'll have to edit that out of the picture. <laughs> but I was just laughing. That was fun. No, he, he, he's a lot of fun, he, my, my friend, but I got to get him over to the mature. But you can be spiritually alive. You can be spiritually alive, but your soul is running the show instead of your spirit. Okay? But you want to speak the truth about your soul. You don't want to lie about your soul. And that's what he says in Psalms 15. <clears throat> okay, look at, um, we, we read Psalms, what was it, 19 and 7? Yes. Uh, read Psalms um, 15. 15. Um, Psalms 15 right here. I, I, I'm going to go back a little bit. So it says here, I'm just going to read this. Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? He who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his soul. You're speaking the truth in your soul. You're not lying to yourself and others. Listen, if you like th other things more than God, your spirit doesn't. You need to say, God, tear down these idols. I don't yeah. know what this is in my life. Lord, I'm, I'm having this issue here, and I don't want it. If you speak the truth with God, God will meet you, and he'll touch you, and he'll do things in your life. God doesn't take care too much for people who lie. And don't, you know, in heaven, he cares for people who lie. I don't want to say the wrong thing. But in heaven, being a hypocrite or fronting or wearing a mask or lying doesn't carry any weight. It's when you speak the truth in your soul. It's when you really tell where you are at. And then you come out to God and you say, hey, I need some help here. Then he comes and he adjusts you. He gives you a Holy Spirit uh, back cracking like a chiropractor. It gets you straightened out. You know? Let's look at this here. Like, look a couple more verses. Psalms, uh, let's go to Psalms uh, uh, let's go to Psalms 42 11. I want you to see what I was talking about where David was talking to his soul. You can talk to your soul. It's okay to talk to your soul. And you don't even have to go see a therapist. You have a soul. Reuben and I were talking about this the other day. And I was saying, man, a man is more than a spirit. A man is a soul and a body. Because God, when he made us, we, it says when he breathed into us, a soul came on us. I'll, I'll connect that one scripture, the only scripture I could find, it was like Joshua, and I said it here, it was Joshua 11, 11, or it was in Joshua, where in the actual original text, it appears that um, 
when their blood left, that their soul, it, there was a connection there. Because I always thought soul was purely uh, not physical. But then it says the life of something is in the soul. And when God breathed into us, he breathed himself. And so we were spirit. That's our eternal. But we have the soul that comes with it. Sometimes, you know, you do a deliverance. You're casting out devils. And the Lord will tell you, okay, now this person has been wounded here before. And you'll talk to them. They'll forgive somebody. You know, their soul will get healed. You'll encourage them. God will do some healing on their soul. And just because somebody's like really um, like touchy or real like, ah, don't go there doesn't necessarily mean it's a demon sometimes people's souls will get so wounded that um, they'll have like a protection mechanism that'll pop up you start to talking about something they're like oh no stop stop we're not going there you know that kind of thing people say oh that person's demonized they might be but you're not always dealing with a demon sometimes just like your body if you ever use so many drugs your body to save your life might store some of those drugs and fat pustules so that way you wouldn't die. You later are fasting and praying, all of a sudden you got an acid trip. Like, where did this come from? It's burning that fat where those drugs were stored, and all of a sudden you're, you're getting the effects of that acid. I've seen it happen. People get their body cleansed and stuff from dope and detoxing, but that can happen in your soul to where you go so, through such sexual uh, trauma or abuse as a young person or whatever. It doesn't have to be sexual, it can be physical or emotional, whatever. And your soul is like having a protector coming up and saying, hey, we're not going to go there because of the wounding. And that's somebody that needs some healing. Demons can hide behind that. doesn't necessarily mean it is a demon. But a person's soul might need the healing power of God, and God comes and heals them, heals that person. God healed me and, and delivered me. And, He'll continue to on this path of life as you go along. You can even walk with God and be a believer and go through stuff and still have some wounding where you need the Lord to heal you as you go along on, on this path. It's a relationship with the Lord. We are um, fed from His presence. And if we don't spend time with Him, the vine, we are the, He is the vine, we're the branch. If we don't get that, that life from Him, we'll die. Um, we need that nutrients. That, that, so if you're just around people, the best part of church is people. The worst part of church is people. Okay. Um, so it's like you, know, you got to get God's perspective on things so that way you stay in the river, you stay fresh, you stay. Jesus got alone with the Father many times. I need it more than Jesus because I'm not God. <laughs> I'm a little G. I'm not an OG because I never was a gangster. But my family's kind of rough. Maybe I was, in a way. Not the way the, the rap songs talk about it. But um, at any rate, um, so what we got here is, is we got our soul realm that we're talking about. It's different than your spirit. Your spirit gets born again with Jesus, but then it sheds life in your soul. Some of you guys' soul has been so dark for 30 years, you've just been watching porn. So you get saved, you got a new little flame on the inside of you. But it's hard for somebody to see it because it's like this lamp of light has so many dark sheets over it. It's the darkness of the soul. Now your soul gets regenerated as you renew the mind and you're walking with God. Your thinking changes. Your heart changes. We're talking about the soul right now. King David was talking about But now listen, he says this in this scripture. Would somebody read that in Psalms 42, 11? Go ahead and read it real quick. I, just, I don't want to go too long. I'm going long this morning. Why are you in despair? Uh, oh, my soul. And why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him. The help of my continuance. Countenance. Countenance. Oh my God. Do you guys ever talk to yourself? Yes. It's yeah. healthy. It's healthy. You're talking to your soul. Yeah. Your spirit can talk to your soul because let me tell you something about your spirit. Your spirit is not bipolar. It never gets depressed. It's always on the upside. It's always thinking heaven no matter what you go through. It outlasts this life. It's greater than your body because it's eternal. You're going to live somewhere forever. You're going to either be with the devil or you're going to be with God forever. You're an eternal living person. But you're going to be either spiritually alive or spiritually dead. If you if you got Christ in you, you're alive. If you don't have Christ in you, you're dead. The blood, the life is in the blood. That's why Satanists and those spirits that came down and revealed that hidden knowledge to 
um, the people. It says the watchers that left their former estate and they were giving them curses and occult stuff. That's why these Satanists have always do these sacrifices. Are in the, it's in the blood. And Satan thought he was going to get God a real good one by killing Jesus. And it was his greatest demise. Amen. It was his greatest demise. And Satan's like going, ah. And that's why Peter writes about it and said, if Satan would have known the plan of God, he never would have crucified Jesus. He just got his tail handed to him. And you know, it's interesting that sometimes when I'm casting out these devils, these devils will say, they'll talk about, you know, they can't be redeemed or they want to be redeemed. And I don't have a conversation with the devil. I tell them to shut up and go. But these spirits, see, you and I can be redeemed. We can have the blood of Jesus wash us. And Jesus always brings it back to relationship. Even when he talks about healing and deliverance, he said, rejoice moreover that your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You're in the family. God is all about family and relationship. So people who only look at technical stuff, they only look at witchcraft or Christianity, people on both sides to, hey, I'm going to use this faith confession to get this over here. You're missing out. The life is in the relationship with Jesus. That's the joy. That's the trap. We don't just pray with people to say a sinner's prayer. We pray with them to get Christ in them. Of course, we don't want them to go to hell. We want Christ to be in them. We want them to go to heaven, right? But, but really, it's about the discipleship and the life of Christ. It's about walking with them. It's about bringing heaven on earth and living in such a close relationship with Jesus that people see the life and love coming through your soul. I'll tell you, sometimes when I come to church, my spirit is always strong. But sometimes my soul gets beat up. It gets beat the heck up because out there, I get cussed out. I have people burn me. I have people lie to me. I have people do dirty things all the time. And i got to minister to my own. i got to encourage my own self. And that's even sometimes in the church there's false brothers that God will show me. Hey, this guy. Or there's people that love God, but they still have some issues in their life that they haven't broken off. And it hinders the church in a way. They're not a false brother. They're just a true brother that's bound in a certain area. And you're dealing with that, you know. Um, but the Bible talks about having love for people because of all of us have different shortcomings and so forth and walking forth in unity. But here's the deal, man. We can minister to our soul. And King David was not nuts when he says, why are you downcast, O my soul? Hope in God. King David prophesied. He would be up a crazy battle and says, we're going to win this thing. And I'm going to see God. I would have despaired unless I believed to see God do a great work here and destroy the devil. He, he said that kind of stuff, you know. Um, he, he basically uh, is bragging on God. And prophesy. You guys in here need to prophesy over your future. Even my own daughter that's grown up around this stuff in faith has sometimes, I, I hear her this last week saying things, man, why am I this way? Saying something negative. Like, no, no, don't say that about yourself. That's not of the Lord. You need to be speaking this over yourself. Yeah. Um, it's so important what comes out of your mouth. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Yeah. I, I've gone through financial troubles that have been crazy, impossible situations. And yet I've said, you know what? God's going to do a miracle here. Uh, God's providing. I'm going to see something happen. And it happens. And people just look at me and shake their head. I look, they think I'm a fool until it comes through. Um, but God's got your back. He's got my back. He loves us. We need to, we need to talk that way. Um, so let's read a couple more scriptures and Psalms. And we'll pray this morning. So Psalms, um, Psalms 42, 11, you, you need to learn to talk to your soul. Why are you downcast? Why are you depressed? Don't let yourself stay there. Don't let, get into praise. If you have to get a, a, you know, a song and start worshiping God, then do it. Worship God. That will minister to your soul to worship. you never seen people fist fight in the parking lot after a really powerful worship service. Because everyone's just hugging on each other because of the glory and love of God, right? But then if you turned on different music or had different people like agitating them, you might have a fist fight in the parking lot. Now you shouldn't really ever have a fist fight in the parking lot of church because everyone should be so, you know, redeemed that, you know, they're walking out Christ on earth in a powerful way. Amen. But but let's let's talk about some people, even though they're born again, they need to tell that their their soul and their body they're born again, right? Because God heals us and, and, and he forgives our sins. So, so we're looking at our soul now. Let's turn to uh, Psalms, um, uh, let's turn to Psalms uh, 103. Mm -hmm. 
Somebody can read that. I'll read it. Uh, <clears throat> bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Okay, stop right there. Did you hear what he's saying there? He's talking about blessing the Lord. He's telling the soul to bless the Lord. Your spirit is going to bless the Lord because your spirit is always on, on a good side. But you're, you're, um, sometimes your you're, you're, you're flesh. Um, so bless the Lord, O oh my soul. That's a good one. Go to Psalms 139. Um, or it's, no, go to 135. Uh, no, go to 122. That's the next one. Psalms 120, verse 2. 120 verse 2? Yeah. Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. Stop right there. If you've got a problem with your mouth and you recognize it, you know sometimes that you lie and you exaggerate, you better cry out to God about that. And here, one of the greatest men of God ever is saying, hey, deliver me from lying lips. I pray, Lord, put a guard on my tongue. Yeah. Because you ever notice how, like, sometimes you get around somebody and they say something and you get emotional and then you want to just release it? And that's when I make my mistakes. And the thing is, is the people that I know the best, I can cut them the most because I know where they're insecure in their issues. Mm -hmm. And so if I get emotional, I can just rip them. Gotcha. But then that's when what separates our relationships the worst. So as I've gotten older, I've realized not to fly off with the emotions because I realized that's the devil speaking. And it was not. It was the devil speaking through my soul. And I want God to speak through my soul. So here he's like, deliver me from lying lips. And deliver me from the, and so we're, we're saying, speaking life to people, we're loving people, we're building up with our tongue. Now, there's a time you got to confront people, obviously, but you don't do it through emotionalism or anger. Yeah. You do it through love and correction and, and bringing in the right heart of God into it. The truth without love is really just slander, you know. If you're using truth to beat somebody up or hurt them, and, and not to build them up or to bring correction, then it's wrong. It's a wrong heart, you know. Because it says love covers up things. It doesn't expose them. So, yeah, so here, isn't that so good? That's something we need to do. Are we going to do it? Yeah, we are. We're going to ask God today. I can pray for you, but I'm not going to pray for you. I'm going <clears> to <throat> encourage you guys to leave this place and say, Lord, let me not lie. Let me not exaggerate. Let me not be deceptive in my heart to, to do witchcraft and gain things. Lord, you bring the blessing in my life. You know what? You do it. I'm not going to... Have you ever, have you ever, like, have you guys ever seen this and maybe you've done it yourself? I've worked with guys in here where they're trying to do everything possible to get this girl. And it's really not a relationship from God. It's a relationship from hell. But they got to prop it up and work so hard and this and that and the other. And the stuff that's from God, the relationships from God are like you're serving God and you're just walking with the Lord. And there's another lady over here. She's walking with God. And, and you're like, hey... Um, I'm walking with God, are you? Yeah, okay. And then it works out, and you link up with them, and there's a peace, and it's that relationship that's that's good. Um, sometimes, you know, God said it's not good for man to be alone, so he put relationships together. But sometimes the devil sees that, and he sees people get saved, and then he brings a bad woman into a good man's life, or a bad man into a good woman's life, not the right time. Not that that person couldn't repent or change, but these new converts that get saved, I always tell them, hey, Oh, this guy, he loves God. I'm going to get with him. I'm like, how long have you been serving God? Oh, he just got saved. I'm like, give it a year. Why? Because I want to see him take some shots and go through some things and see if he's still consistent after that time. And then many times they wash out. They were only going to church for the guy or the girl. You know, it wasn't a true deal. It was fake, you know. But the devil will use that. You know, he'll use it. Be wise. Don't be foolish. All right, let's get a couple more psalms here. I'll cut you loose. Some of you guys are fading on me. I'm going to get a water <laughs> stone. Okay, 122. What's that? I didn't even go to the Last night I went to the carnival over here in the Target parking lot. And I was going to call Sean. Hey, Sean, can you drop a couple of pee cups off with me? I just want to make sure this ride's safe and all the bolts are in before I get on this thing. But we did have a good time. Uh, 130. 130, verse 5. Psalms 130. Uh, I wait for the Lord. 
I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I do hope. Oh man, so beautiful. How many of you guys shut off your phones? And outside of morning prayer, we're praying for an hour, uh, an hour you just go to spend time and you wait for the Lord. You're not putting anything together, you're not rushing anything, you're just waiting on the Lord. Yeah, okay. Be still and know that I'm God. Yeah, yeah that's good. Um, I could do more of that, I can tell you that I'm not sure. right now. I'm not very good at doing that. But I'm getting convicted. Today I'm going to answer my own altar call right now. <laughs> Psalms 139. Uh, Psalms 139 in this 13 to 14. For you formed my inward parts, you covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Oh my gosh, there's so much to unpack here. Teddy Bolton has a, a tape over there. He was a prophet that was at his care for a while. Wayne and Shirley and all, we all enjoyed Teddy. He was 86 when he died. But he has revelation on this that's second to none, just straight from heaven. But I don't want to go, that would take me four hours. But anyways, this, just see here, he's talking about my soul knows very well. You know, it's, it's his soul. Um, so this morning, um, I was just hitting a little bit about the soul. Um, you, you can train your soul. You can talk to your soul. And we won't, you know, get a straight jacket out. A lot of times people use drugs and, you know, the psychiatrist is hey, you can use drugs. And that's not what God intended for you to do. He never intended for you to take drugs. He intended you to encourage your soul to talk to your soul. Sometimes you'll come to church and your soul will be really low. But then after the worship and the word of God, your soul gets encouraged. You know, you can encourage yourself in the Lord. See, your spirit doesn't need that encouragement. Your spirit's one with God. It's, it's powerful. It's always full. Your soul is the one that gets depressed. But Christians shouldn't be depressed. There should not be a thing as a bipolar Christian. It should be just you're straight, you're up, you're strong. Yeah. Because what's happening in the spirit is flowing through to your soul. The problem is we can't trust our soul. The Bible says the heart is de desperately wicked. You can know it. Have you ever thought that there was a relationship, that, that she was the one for you, and there was no other, and then later on you found out you were wrong? Yeah. Yeah. Your heart deceived you. Yeah. Okay? Your heart is deceptively wicked. You know? Some of you guys are getting a little more amens on that than others, but um, you probably got a story behind that. But the thing is, is that um, your soul is deceptive, because here's what your soul can do. Your soul can believe things other than the Word of God is true. You follow me? Yeah. So if you listen to nothing but the Word of God, your soul will eventually believe the Word of God because you've said it loud enough and long enough. You've washed the dirt out of your soul. Okay? Remember that scripture where Jesus says, well, I find faith when I come back on earth. Remember that? And he says, you know, he talks about a woman who was getting a uh, bad rap and there was an unjust judge because but the woman was such a nag that she finally got what she wanted, not because the judge was just, because he was unjust, but because he was like, man, get this woman out of my face. I've had it. I'm tired. I don't want her griping anymore. All of a sudden, the judge is like, whatever she wants, get her, get her out of here. Most people had to buy her off. My friends, that's your soul, not the Father God. You know why you confess the word continually? Not because God needs it, but because you need it. You know why you pray in tongues? It's because it says the spirit of man is a candle of the Lord. You take a candle in a deep, dark place, searching out the soul. You pray in tongues, those twisted places in your soul are getting, you know, removed. Those things that you loved other than God, they're getting cut out. That's why Satan hates for you to pray in the spirit much. And that's why he, Satan has deceived many believers. Many believers in this day and age don't believe praying in tongues is the foundational truth. It is. You would benefit greatly to never stop praying in tongues. I had one of my, my Baptist family members say to me the other day after they saw all the fruit, 
and the kids and stuff, and we've known each other for years. And he says, I might have been wrong about this praying in the Spirit. I could never really talk to them about it, but when they see the fruit of how it affects your life, that's when they're going, hey, you know, there might be something to this. You know, even though they were so entrenched in false doctrine that there wasn't. But they couldn't deny what they saw. If you sow in the Spirit, you're going to reap a harvest. Don't quit. Amen. So, confession. One time, I thought I was committed to unpardonable. I couldn't come back. There was no hope for me. I went up in the woods and I confess that scripture on the righteousness of God in Christ hundreds hundreds of times until I believed it and I walked out in faith. Amen. I wasn't trying to convince God. I was trying to get my mind right from the lies of the past and the things that the devil was throwing at me. You can minister to your soul. You can encourage yourself in the Lord. There's going to be a time where you're not going to have anybody else to encourage you. You're going to have to encourage yourself. And you're yeah. going to do it. Yeah. Lord, I pray today that you would strengthen strengthen people and uh, cause, Lord, uh, Lord, cause there to be some action, not just hearing the word and going away and doing nothing, but let there be some changing in the things that we listen to, the music, what we watch. Uh, let there be, Father God, a real effort, a discipline, Lord, to uh, get your word and, Lord, get... Uh, your truth into our soul. We ask, Lord, I just ask right now that if there's anybody downcast today, that would be broken off their soul. Yes. No depression, depression, a suicide, uh, anxiety. Lord, I just lift up, Father God, the people that are watching, Lord, on uh, Facebook, that you'd strengthen them, encourage them, let them make it. Lord, let your eternal hope come through the media and just raise them up off the affliction, off the depression. I rebuke every unclean spirit and function and form. I release the spirit, the power of God to flow through uh, the TV, the YouTube, the Facebook, through this uh, area right here. And cause, Lord, adjustments that are needed. Healing to the soul right now. Uh, strength to the soul. Joy to the soul. That the joy of the Lord is our strength. And we thank you for doing it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.